Good afternoon for Europe and Africa, and good evening for Asia. Thank you for joining us for this third Write On Web Chat, this time on democracy and rule of law in crisis. Today, Felix and I, Felix is from the Geneva Academy, uh, will co-moderate the session. So welcome everybody from everywhere around the world. Um, it's always very nice to have these web chats and have people from all four corners of the earth. Um, before we present the speakers, I would like to say a little bit about today's discussion. Clearly, COVID-19, and especially government's response thereto, has huge implications for democracy, rule of law, and for the enjoyment of human rights. In some cases, those implications are obvious. For example, there's been much criticism of, uh, of Hungary and the decision of parliament there to grant sweeping powers uh, to Viktor Orban. Uh, to rule by decree with no time limit and apparently no check on those on those powers. Even though it's interesting to know there is apparently wide public support for those measures. So maybe that's something we can talk about during the discussion. Other situations are less blatant perhaps, but equally important in terms of the possible consequences. For example, if parliaments are suspended in the UK, for example, who will hold the government to account? In Serbia, the Prime Minister has said that only the authorities can make pronouncements about COVID-19, something journalists in the country have said is tantamount to censorship, though later the Prime Minister backtracked. In the US, Donald Trump has claimed last week that he has, quote, total power to decide when to end the lockdown, although he also backtracked the day after. There's also the important question of elections. Democracy, the elections are the basis or the bedrock of democracy, but how can we hold elections uh, during a time of quarantine? All of these important questions raise other questions. What limit, what powers, what measures are proportionate? How to maintain democratic checks and balances uh, of these measures during COVID-19? Uh, pandemic, and how to protect human rights throughout this period. So today we have a fantastic uh, panel with us. Everybody, I think, is, is with us. Um, on the panel, we have uh, Ilza Brands Keris, who is the Assistant Secretary General for Human Rights uh, and the head of the UN Human Rights Office in New York, of OHHR. We have Miss Annika Ben-David, who is Sweden's ambassador at large for human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. We have another Annika, Annika Silva Leander, who heads the Democracy Assessment and Political Analysis Unit at International IDEA, also Swedish, so two Annikas from Sweden. Uh, we also have Mr. Yuval Shani, who is a member of the UN Human Rights Committee, uh, professor of law at the Hebrew University and a lecturer at the Geneva Academy. And last but not least, we have Mr. Martin Walecki, who's head of Democratiza the democratization department at the OSCE, Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights. So before we pass over the floor to Felix and all of those impressive uh, speakers, welcome to all of you. Uh, we would like to hear the general public's uh, views on one of the questions that arises from uh, today's discussions. So the poll question is the following. Should governments still be subject to democratic scrutiny and press criticism, even during the current emergency? It's a simple one to get everybody started, yes or no. Uh, and so in a second, we will uh, see the results. This is an important question. It may seem obvious, the answer. Although one person I notice has voted no, which is good, gives a bit of variety. But it's not necessarily as easy as it suggests, as the question suggests, as I said in my introduction. There are there are black, there's white, but there's also grey in between. Okay, we will in a second close the poll. 
There we go. So one brave soul voted no. Kudos to that person, because as I said, it's not necessarily straightforward. A lot of governments have said that we're in a war time situation and therefore we, the press should not really be criticizing the government. Uh, so it's not as obvious as it seems. However, you voted overwhelmingly in the affirmative. I will now then, without further ado, pass the floor to Felix, who will moderate the discussion with our experts. Please, Felix. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark, and uh, welcome from me also to all of you here online. It's a pleasure to co-moderate moderate this meeting. Uh, Mark, as you said, uh, the we could expect the result of that poll, but indeed, if it was a poll, uh, that's a that poll done with the audience that links into to such meetings. How about a poll if it was with the real general public? We cannot say out on the street because out on the street there isn't much to poll right now. But actually, as you mentioned, it might be it might look different. Now I'll give the floor to all of our speakers to address us on that issue. And as you all know, we are in a uh, special setting here online. Uh, we set uh, one hour for this web chat. So I'll ask everybody to really stick to the time, keep uh, the answers to two minutes maximum. So we'll have time for the discussion first with the speakers, but then also to bring in questions from the audience and have a discussion with the participants. So without uh, further ado, I would like to uh, start first um, turning to Ambassador Annika Ben-David. Annika, you are uh, Sweden's Ambassador for Human Rights, Democracy and the Rule of Law. So your title uh, covers the whole area of this meeting, I think. Um, I would like to ask you about um, your government. Sweden recently launched a um, global push for democracy as a key plank for the country's foreign policy. Is there a risk that COVID-19 actually will add to the growing pushback against democracy that we can see globally? And can democracy continue to function when, for example, parliaments, as mentioned in their introduction, are not able to sit at all or not able to sit uh, regularly due to social distancing rules? So Annika, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Felix. It's good to be with all of you. Uh, and let me just first say that the corona crisis, of course, holds enormous consequences for societies, consequences aggra aggravated by weak governance, weak health systems, socioeconomic inequality, poverty, conflict, and that this pandemic will have major impact on the poorest countries of the world, and particularly all those individuals that are already discriminated against and marginalized, including women and, and girls. And the background to Sweden's Drive for Democracy, a foreign policy initiative that mobilizes our entire foreign service, is to, to curb the global trend of declining democracy and weakening respect for human rights. And it's clear now that uh, this trend is, is further compounded by the corona crisis. So it means that the drive for democracy is even more relevant uh, than before, and it will continue full force together with our feminist foreign policy. Right now, we are concerned about mainly two things. First, that uh, the responses by states will have serious and far-reaching repercussions on the enjoyment of human rights. Uh, this is imminent during the crisis, and there's ample evidence uh, of states using the situation as an excuse to limit the enjoyment of human rights, silencing opposition, uh, civil rights, uh, civil society, or, or human rights defenders. But we must also remain vigilant regarding the possible lasting effects on the international human rights system as such, and for individuals in their everyday life. We cannot let standards be altered. Secondly, uh, what happens when much of the formal human rights system is on hold? Well, uh, we need to secure accountability and dialogue through continued multilateral cooperation. We need to find ways during the crisis to make this, this possible. We need continued reporting, monitoring, by the multilateral system and we need a civil society which is listened to and provided the means to continue their work. And just to close, three very quick priorities for Sweden right now in the immediate phase. First, to ensure transparency and access to reliable information and to fight disinformation. 
Second, uh, we need to make sure that all measures to mitigate uh, the crisis should reach all individuals in need without discrimination. The socioeconomic dimension here is very important. And third, that we need to work together simply. This situation shows, I think, the absolute necessity of uh, international cooperation, international solidarity, and it's not the time for protectionism or isolation. Thanks. Thank you very much, Annika. And um, <clears throat> well, your reference to discrimination resounds a lot, uh, non-discrimination with the talk we had just last week on that topic. And actually also there, I think the speakers reiterated the importance for uh, addressing underlying factors of discrimination, which are now just coming to the fore. Uh, you mentioned also um, the excuse uh, that this uh, crisis brings for many um, governments to silence civil society and uh, to go in restrictions maybe further than it would be necessary. I think the Swedish way is in the media also rather um, commented as a, a way that goes quite the other direction in terms of uh, uh, having very few restrictions in place. Um, before now coming to a second question, um, I would like just to show the colleagues to show another slide. It's the Democracy Index in 2019. Mm -hmm. Give you a second to, to look at it. So as you can see on the screens, uh, the index was highest in countries in North America and Western Europe, and uh, lowest in Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, and the uh, MENA region. Um, now, if I um, may come in the second question also a little bit to the aspect of, of right to health, because it's precisely those regions where countries are reporting successes in con uh, containing the virus. So does that suggest that health pandemics are democracy's Achilles heel, if we can say that? Lisa. Like I said, uh, I think authoritarian regimes or countries with authoritarian leanings or populistic leanings will use this opportunity to spread their messages and to strengthen their position. Um, we take note of the propaganda claiming that authoritarian systems of governance would do better with corona and this is part of the narrative where states will compete on who comes out as a winner on the other side of the crisis. I think that in the aftermath of all this, we will face a discussion revolving around which form of government counted the outbreak more, most efficiently. And in this discussion, we will have an important task in owning the narrative and arguing for the rightness of a democratic human rights-based approach to countering uh, the pandemic and to look at how our existing commitments and obligations could be used more efficiently in a similar situation in the future. So I think it's up to us to make sure that the answer is, as I said, multilateral solutions and cooperation rather than isolation and strongman politics. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for this uh, clear message and putting the discourse straight. I think we'll definitely come back to this because we'll stay in our discussion now looking at a number of uh, questions around democracy, uh, democratic or less democratic states dealing with the crisis. So I think it's an important uh, putting into perspective <clears throat> how the news that we see from different parts of the world need to be, need to be read, actually. I would like to uh, come directly to our second speaker. Um, Annika Silva Leander. Um, so, sorry. Um, as introduced earlier by Mark, you are um, the head of the Democracy Assessment and Political Analysis Unit at International IDEA. So we have a civil society voice here. Um, somebody looks at uh, democratization, uh, democratic leadership, and I think uh, for you a question I would have would be on elections and political and uh, democratic processes. As uh, we know, important elections are due this year in a number of countries. And uh, there was already a controversy in March uh, here in France, actually, the country I live in, uh, about the local elections. So the first turn of the elections, uh, the first round took place. The second one was then postponed. It was at the start of the country's lockdown. So how realistic would you think is it holding uh, elections during a health pandemic? Uh, 
Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I think um, just to, to reiterate what the other Annika was saying, this is really a historically unprecedented situation. And we've never had so many countries around the world being affected on this scale at the same time. So what we're undergoing is, a, is really a huge global experiment, both on the health uh, front, but also on the political and the economic fronts. And we're learning lessons every day uh, as the world is trying to manage this unprecedented situation also when it comes to, to the area of elections. Um, and there are numerous challenges indeed to holding an election during a pandemic. Uh, and that's why we see more countries having decided to postpone their elections right now than proceeding with them. 50 countries in total have decided to postpone their elections, either national or subnational elections, and only 18 countries have decided to go ahead with them. And the reason is both the, the health risks involved of holding an election during a pandemic, um, both for election workers and also for voters and polling staff, um, and especially when, when a number of countries are still under partial or full lockdown, um, as elections in most countries in the world still involve going to a polling station to vote. Online voting is, is still the exception than the norm, more the exception than the norm, and postal voting tends to be limited to certain groups or to certain parts of, of countries. Um, then there's also the risk of, of legitimacy of elections going ahead under a pandemic because we know that there is a high risk for lower turnout under those contexts where uh, voters will fear going out of being, for fear of being infected during, during this time. And also for, in terms of the more limited campaigning opportunities for political parties. Um, so going ahead with an election during a pandemic is not an easy decision uh, and needs to be weighed very carefully in terms of both the, the the risks and 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 the pros in that situation i think there are a number of factors to consider one is the political context um, it's going to be very difficult different to go ahead with a with an election in a well-functioning and healthy democracy which has robust electoral institutions and processes in place uh, in those cases the risk will be lower versus a, a country which is democratically backsliding I'm taking the case of, I'm thinking of Poland, or a non-democratic context altogether. Uh, in this case, elections are likely to, to be flawed even uh, if it wasn't uh, during a pandemic situation. Um, careful consideration also have to be weighed into the equation in terms of um, the risk of postponing an election, uh, for both from health and from a political perspective, but also from a capacity perspective. Uh, does the electoral system have the capacity to implement an election during, um, during a pandemic, particularly when it comes to implementing a number of virus containment measures to ensure that the voting process is safe uh, Thank you. from a yes, health sir. perspective? Um, Thanks, sorry for interrupting. Yes, as you say, there's the, the political questions and there's the technical questions as some countries also in the past have experimented with digital voting and some of them went back. Um, so uh, staying a little bit with the um, question of um, technology also, we would have a short um, slide to show if I could ask the colleagues to put that on. So it's a percentage of respondents who think uh, technology will change democracy. So now we're not talking about our audience, but about a larger statistical poll. So I think it comes in with also what you say of different countries uh, expecting quite different outcomes of a switch to technology. Yeah. And so actually, I think uh, if I may come back to the screen, yes, uh, so digital technology has played a crucial role with the outbreak of the COVID-19 situation and all the lockdowns. Our lives somehow have transitioned online. Um, so there are greater discussions also on the impact of techno technology, digital, digital technology on democracy. Um, so when we see that uh, China and other um, respondents uh, expect less uh, change, uh, uh, bigger changes. Uh, Western Europe and Japan are more skeptical. Um, it appears that a growing trend, uh, part of um, as part of the populist uh, leaders, uh, also um, prohibiting protest currently. So coming from the regular voting to more the protest setting, pro prohibiting protest. 
of people advocating for the protection of civil liberties in the face of lockdowns. So what would you be your worry in that particular area? Um, yes, indeed, we should be worried about uh, political leaders um, denying the, the severity of the health crisis. That is a great concern. Um, and it's even dangerous, I would say. Um, I mean, there are a number of countries, uh, for example, Nicaragua, but, uh, which is a non-democratic country, but also Brazil, uh, which has a democratically elected leader. And um, it has severe consequences um, because a political leader um, models behavior. And if a political leader um, you know, makes um, risky uh, health behavior acceptable, then it's like, likely to be multiplied and replicated among the population, putting uh, uh, large uh, numbers uh, in the population at risk of contracting the virus. So it's, it's really worrisome. Um, and, um, and this is especially worrisome in countries that have very weak health systems. And I, I think that the denialism that we have seen has been occurring at, in, in a number of countries that have extremely weak health systems. And, and that is uh, even more worrying because uh, the, the spread of the disease uh, coming out of such risky behavior is gonna be, have more severe consequences than in other contexts. Thank you, thank you very much for that um, <clears throat> view from civil society on those challenges that we have in regular democratic processes and in protests. Um, I would like now to turn to um, Ilse Brandskeris. Ilse, I see you also joined us. Uh, welcome to you here on this talk. Uh, Ilse Brandskeris is Assistant Secretary General for Human Rights and heads the UN Human Rights Office in New York. So, um, media and NGO report flagrant misuses in many countries of emergency rule and repressive policies, and this has been uh, alluded to by previous speakers. Uh, generally, I think many countries seem to use the opportunity of the crisis to do what they anyway always wanted to do, whether this is to cut funding for multilateralism, impose restrictions on civil society and political opposition. Uh, instead of uh, citing media reports, uh, which all our participants can also look at, I think a recent example, luckily with a positive outcome, is quite telling also that we just experienced ourselves at the Academy a Vietnamese human rights activist had interacted with the UN Special Rapporteur in a meeting and upon returning to her country was, re was arrested and put in quarantine for uh, COVID reasons, but then actually was repeatedly uh, interrogated, was prevented from communicating her papers, uh, communication devices were taken away from her and only after efforts by her lawyers and also the team at OHCHR uh, dealing with uh, reprisals uh, against um, people who uh, inform uh, or who cooperate with the UN, she was able to return uh, home. So I think such situations, in that case, one with a positive end, but we see that many governments have responded to the COVID-19 pandemic by declaring states of emergency, suspending democratic checks and balances is the UN and more particularly the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights uh, concerned that the pandemic is being used as an excuse by some leaders to grab power and to stop criticism or scrutiny in human rights terms, Ilse? Thank you. Um, and thank you for mentioning also a hopeful case, which I think shows the importance of really um, of our engagement and, and interaction, um, both multilaterally and of course also of all the actors, and I'm happy to hear the ones that already spoke. We are very concerned. We monitor um, the situation that is part of what uh, the work that we're doing. So we're gathering all the information from across the world. And indeed, there is evidence, obviously, as you say, in situations where there already was a tendency of restrictive or authoritarian regimes to use this occasion. We're seeing increases in restrictions on all the freedoms, obviously movement, but also um, assembly and clearly uh, expression as well. But um, the problem there is of course that there are restrictions that in some cases could perhaps be adopted during this time, but that the way they're done, they're not proportional, nor are they limited in time very often. The restrictions can come uh, th simply through implementing existing laws, adopting new laws, or as you're saying, many states that have adopted uh, states of emergencies that go way beyond the immediate need um, of, of the situation. And this is something we're very concerned about. There's also the aspect of 
violence, of increased actual um, repression, physical repression, increased um, policing, um, and, and really a, a suppression of, of expression of any kind of dissent. Um, this is something that we're following, and of course, we're also uh, giving advice and guidance. And by the way, today or tomorrow, our office will issue also guidance on um, states of emergency, which I think will be a very important uh, point um, in this regard. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm sure this guidance will be very welcome. I'll come back to guidance for states of em uh, emergency also with a, a further speaker later on in this talk. Um, but I think also you, you point out the way how uh, restrictions can be taken, but how the proportionality, the time bound, uh, um, question is very important. Um, and I also want to add that obviously uh, in the very uh, introduction we uh, referred to some restrictive and less uh, democratic governments, but also equally in established democracies, uh, parliaments have been suspended, media are told to be more patriotic, to avoid criticism, criticizing the government during what is portrayed in, in my view, ill-chosen terminology as a war. Is it equally dangerous what we see uh, kind of an erosion on that side as to what uh, you and others just commented in more restrictive settings with really direct violence spreading? How about that general erosion maybe of the um, um, of human rights or the rule of law and uh, the respect for rule of law? Yes, uh, I, I think the concern is, is clearly there across the board, um, and I, I'm, I'm happy that our first speaker, uh, Annika, also mentioned the very important issue of narrative, and, and you're also going in that direction when you mention uh, war as, as one of the metaphors used. But I think the overall narrative on the importance of human rights and the centrality of human rights in this in time of crisis, that of course is both the health crisis and all the other concerns, is, is very important. But we also see very specific measures. The limitations obviously on movement are there um, in most countries, but in particular concerns on the checks and balances, as you're saying, the parliaments um, that are either um, out of session or are very limited, so that the question of oversight, um, their oversight function in general, that therefore is taken away from the checks and balance system. Also, a particularly the legal scrutiny of, um, from a human rights perspective, that then is not taking place. We heard already about the elections, which of course goes to the issue of participation and also the, the unequal uh, access to participation that is there, the issue of misinformation and how to tackle that, which has been mentioned already, but this is clearly something that also has come up in a lot of uh, democratic and established democratic countries, the question of how to deal with it. And, and a very risky way of doing it is, of course, by adopting uh, laws and certainly um, criminalization of, of any form of speech uh, uh, would be of great concern. The role of media and also the, the general pressure. So it's not even in more developed democracies, perhaps it's also an issue of not necessarily restricting uh, legally speaking, but the pressure to be patriotic or to not do certain things, of course, has a chilling effect as such. Um, the importance of civil society, human rights defenders is very important. I just wanted to say one last thing on that regard. So when we talk about this and the checks and balances particularly, I think is important um, to look at that. Are we really then talking about the crisis of democracy or maybe that would unifies these um, non-democratic authoritarian countries and democracies is really that maybe we should be talking about a potential crisis of governance, that the issue really is good governance. And I mean here going beyond the rule of law questions, beyond corruption, which is the ones we usually focus in on, but really what is good governance and how should that take place? And then of course, we also have the multilateral level for the governance question as well and the role of the multilateral institutions or regional ones for that matter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ilse. Thank you for also setting the topic for a future uh, right on talk. We'll take note of that. And I think also once we get into the second round of questions, we might come also back to what concretely OHCHR uh, can do and is planning, as you already uh, mentioned, one example. I would like uh, to turn to Professor Yuval Shani now. Yuval, you're a professor at the Hebrew University. You're teaching with us at the Geneva Academy. You're also a member of the Human Rights Committee. And uh, I think uh, 
my question will go in a way uh, in that direction. I'll just try very quickly one thing, whether I can actually share a screen. So I'm just sharing. I think it might work for you. Um, a tracking tool provided by the NGO CCPR Center, and I'm showing it on the screen, shows that out of uh, 86 states that have declared a state of emergency in response to the COVID pandemic, only 11 have submitted a notification to the UN. And I dare say that uh, France, Switzerland, US, Hungary, others that were mentioned before are not among those 11 who have submitted a notification. What does that mean actually in terms of legality under international human rights law for such measures? If you could comment on that, Yuval, the floor is yours. Thank you, Felix. Uh, this is, of course, uh, well, well, good afternoon to everyone and thank you for hosting me. It's good to see some familiar faces, uh, even though uh, via Zoom. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, this is, of course, uh, information which we are greatly concerned about at the Human Rights Committee. And I'm glad to hear uh, from uh, Ilza Branskeris that there is uh, an interest on, uh, in publishing some guidance. Uh, the Human Rights Committee would also now, is also now actively considering issuing a, a statement in this regard. Um, uh, I think it's very important to underscore the point that whenever a state is actually derogating from a legal obligation, it has to issue a formal notice of derogation. Without uh, engaging in this practice, uh, the state in question is violating a, a procedural obligation and may also be violating a substantive obligation. So this is very important. Why is it that states are not uh, rendering derogations? I mean, maybe some states are. Uh, figuring out that the measures that they are taking under domestic state of emergency does not violate their obligations under the covenant. It is, it is, it is possible. Uh, I should say that the position of the Human Rights Committee as expressed in General Comment 29 is that even in a state of emergency, the preference should always be to taking measures that do not rely on a form of derogation, but actually are taken within the framework of the limitation or restriction provisions that are available to states uh, under e even outside situations of emergency. So it may be the case that some states are bona fide under the view impression that the measures that they are taking are compliant with their obligations. This is something that we will have to uh, explore uh, when we will review uh, state practice and we will review individual communications. Uh, but uh, I'm afraid that some states are simply either ignorant of, the, of their procedural obligations or do not want to attract, uh, so to speak, attention to, to their situation by uh, submitting a notification. So this is uh, something which is of great concern because we do see this uh, significant gap and we are also aware of measures that have been taken in countries uh, which uh, have declared a state of emergency did not submit uh, a formal notification and yet these measures appear to be prima facie uh, incompatible with their uh, treaty uh, obligations under the covenant. So we definitely have a problem here which we will have to uh, deal with and we hope that uh, we will be able, uh, we and other uh, actors, stakeholders, uh, UN agencies, regional actors, civil society will drive home the message about the importance of notification for bringing on you know, exactly the kind of scrutiny and attention that you would want to bring to such situations where states are uh, exercising exceptional powers, circumventing the standard uh, democratic check and ba checks and balances. No, no, you have to uh, speak again. Sorry. So it should be fine. Uh, thank you, Yuval. And uh, turning from, uh, if I may, the Human Rights Committee member to the law professor, uh, in your view, what would need to be yardstick in the development of such emergency policies if you were to advise OHCHR in that case, or also uh, what, what would be concrete examples? So not, not as a list of countries, but examples as, as areas, as policies where you would see governments currently disrespecting the rule of law and human rights uh, obligations. So, so one important, so, so the whole idea of, uh, of derogation, the way we understand it in general comment 29, which I think is, is a good uh, starting point for the discussion, is that the goal of uh, derogation is to return to normalcy. So this is really what this is. I think the, the, the principal criteria for us is are the measures in questions uh, 
temporary nature, namely, and, and that is often a formal condition uh, that uh, is uh, that entails the introduction of sunset clauses, etc., but which is geared to return to normalcy and to return to the normal enjoyment of human rights. So this is, uh, I think, in terms of the object and purpose of the measure in question, this is a very important test that has to be e examined. I mean, the second uh, element is, is the element of the checks and balances. I think it is critical that even, and maybe particularly in times of emergency, checks and balances, internal checks and balances continue to occur. So Article 4 of the Covenant does speak about a declaration of a state of emergency in accordance with domestic constitutional provisions. So it's important that the domestic process that has its own safe, uh, safeguards is, is respected. And it is important then that parliamentary review, civil society discourse, judicial review, all of these elements continue to, to, to be put in place. And then of course, once you cross these so to speak procedural hurdles, one has to engage in a more substantive evaluation of the measures taken and their proportionality are they the least harmful measures that could have been resorted to? Are they measures that are intended to uh, facilitate the exercise of rights under the particular conditions generated by COVID or in, in a way to, to uh, curtail the exercise of the right? For instance, the, the freedom of assembly. Are states uh, simply curbing uh, assemblies or are states uh, uh, looking into the possibilities of a, a allowing or facilitating the exercise of freedom of assembly while, for instance, using social distancing. Mm. I think there was a very powerful image from Tel Aviv the other day of, uh, of, a, mm. of a large assembly that was uh, respecting social distancing. And I think this is, uh, I mean, this was for this specific case, actually a good model of how you can facilitate I mean, I have many other bad examples from the Tel Aviv region, which I don't want to discuss now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Yuval. Thank you for that. And I think your point on return to normal is something also that leads nicely over to our final speaker in, in this panel, Mr. Marcin Walecki, head of democratization department at the OSCE Office for Democ Democratic Institutions and Human Rights. Martin, the OSCE is exactly monitoring states of emergency and uh, suspension of democratic uh, norms and rules in Europe, I think. Are you concerned that the uh, COVID crisis is being used as an excuse in some countries to strengthen the central control at the expense of human rights and exactly not to return to normal as it was just uh, stated before, which should be the main guidepost of any state of emergency? Uh, Marcin, over to you. Thank you, Felix, and, and warm greetings to over 125 participants. Uh, as a last speaker, no pressure. So what I'll try to do is to build on the points uh, which my colleagues made. I uh, strongly agree with Ambassador Ben David. Uh, there is a clear trend. We all know about it. We've seen it for the last decade. Uh, and we actually see how certain regimes have been taking advantage of this crisis. What I'm going to do in my 90 seconds, 120 seconds, which you gave me, Felix, is just show you some examples of what we've been doing. Indeed, uh, as Ambassador, as um, Professor Shani mentioned, we are also monitoring situation with a state of emergency. This is a very clear commitment uh, which participating states have. As you know, OEC is the largest security organization, and we are very privileged to have a very strong political commitments, starting with Moscow 91, where basically give our office um, a mandate to monitor. Uh, the situation in participating states. And as of last week, we had 11 participating states informing us in details about state of emergency. We know about eight other cases where some other measures been taken. We created a special task force where we basically on daily basis, we, we have a, at least 10 priority areas where we are monitoring how the state of emergency is impacting human dimension, uh, human rights. And I just want to share with you on the chat some examples of important statements which our office, our director made, starting first of all with um, you know, proportionality uh, of the state of emergency. And you're probably all familiar with the case of uh, Hungary. And actually my feeling is that organizations like ours, we are really acting as a fire brigade. Uh, you know, the amount of work which we're doing is at least two, three times uh, larger than in a normal uh, situation. We're organizing a number of webinars, discussions. 
This is an example of a statement coming uh, after the consultations with over 30 organizations, Hungarian International on a Situation in Hungary, which was issued in late March. Um, you will also see we are very concerned when it comes to the situation with parliaments. I'm sharing with you another joint statement which we did yesterday with OSC Parliamentary Assembly. Um, this is another thing which uh, Ambassador Ben David also mentioned. Parliaments and what is happening with parliaments is indeed a priority for our office. Um, and we are uh, closely monitoring um, how parliaments, because again, we have a very clear commitment. Parliaments should be functioning properly during the state of emergency. And we are seeing number of countries where this is not the case. This is another example of, uh, you know, um, what we believe, um, you know, is wrong with uh, some approaches. Um, we will put all this information into our report, which will be coming up uh, very soon. We are in the process of discussing it with our director, Ingi Bergdisadotir, how this report should be issued. But I know that colleagues are also very concerned about elections. And um, because we are based in Warsaw, in Poland, uh, obviously we are monitoring very closely what is happening with elections in Poland. Um, the third statement I just want to give you an example, because I don't have time to go into details, is probably one of the strongest statements I've ever seen coming from our office when it comes to um, elections. Uh, you should not be surprised, we will not have a capacity to monitor elections in Poland because of the current situation. But what we are actually doing at the request of the Senate and the Ombudsman, we're preparing a legal opinion on changes to the electoral code. This opinion should be published Monday, Tuesday next week. Again, normally it takes us up to one month, two months to produce such a legal opinions. We're doing it in a matter of seven working days. So you see also how dynamic this whole environment is in terms of us responding to some of those crises. Uh, issue which was not mentioned, um, but it's very important for our office, especially for colleagues working on tolerance and non discrimination is, uh, you know, the, um, attacks on uh, vulnerable groups. Uh, this is yet another example, a priority area where um, we are working on. Um, and, you know, I'm sharing th with you those uh, statements so you get a detailed description of uh, what our concerns are and how we're responding to it. Um, just to, to uh, sum up, I fully agree with Ambassador Ben David. Some regimes obviously are taking advantage of the situation. Um, the trend, which would normally, you know, started in 2010, 2008, in case of some other countries, 2015, uh, we are seeing uh, how things are changing basically on a weekly basis. Uh, but I also believe as far as, you know, most of us were pessimistic, we should, 70, 80% of developments are worrying. We're also seeing some positive developments. We also are collecting good examples of how parliaments, judiciary are using new technologies, are trying to adopt to this new normal. Um, and the reforms which we were pushing for in terms of new technologies for parliaments, and we've been pushing it with open uh, government initiative, with open parliaments initiative. Normally, you know, it would take years uh, to adopt, to promote those uh, solutions. Now we're seeing how parliaments are adopting in a matter of weeks, and the same with judiciary. So overall, you know, 70, 80% worrying developments, but we should not also forget that this crisis, this new normal, creates opportunities for new ways of participation and new forms of working on governance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcin. Thank you for ending on that positive note. So I don't want uh, necessarily to subscribe to the crisis becoming the new normal. I hope there will be some intermediate, but surely there is things to be learned from the situation we are in right now that should be taken over. Um, with this, I would like to thank you for that first round for your interventions and hand it over to my co-moderator, Mark who will bring in a question from a youth, from youth speaker from the Model UN and also questions from the audience before we give it back to you for some closing remarks to the panelists. So over to you, Mark. Thank you, Felix, and thanks to all of the speakers. It was very, very interesting interventions and a great debate. Um, and everybody stuck to the time limit, which is fantastic uh, for online discussion, so thank you. Um, we're now going to widen the debate. We have 15 or so minutes left uh, by bringing in the audience uh, for some questions that have been posed. But we're going to start by widening the de debate to bring in uh, the voice of the youth. Um, so we have Jessian Gray with us, who's from the Model UN, specifically the Ferne Voltaire Model UN. There she is. I recognize her. Um, Jesse, and you're going to ask uh, a question to either everybody and then people can 
answer as we go through the answers uh, to all the other questions or to one specific person. Uh, but please, the floor is yours. Yeah, so more of a general question to anyone who wants to answer. Um, in the context of all the exceptional situations we've been discussing, and maybe also especially in the context of some technical solutions that have appeared like digital contact tracing, immunity badges, um, movement surveillance, how much liberty and privacy should a democratic government expect its, its citizens to be willing to give up in this situation? And as citizens, how, what action should we take when we notice our governments overstepping that limit? Great, thank you, Jessien. Great question, short question, but very, very uh, important question. Um, everybody could hold, if everybody could hold off on answering it though, uh, and you can answer it when you answer the specific questions that we've received from the audience. So I'll start with a question to uh, Ilza Brankeris, the Assistant Secretary General for Human Rights. Uh, as we heard, especially from uh, Yuval earlier, very few states are, uh, are notifying the states of emergency or the measures they're taking. Um, is the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and the Secretary General as well, are you equally concerned about this? that countries are taking these measures and are not notifying them, so not being transparent, uh, as the other speakers were concerned. And you can also respond to the question from the youth representative, please. Thank you. Um, yes, definitely, we are very concerned. We're following very closely, both the High Commissioner and, and our office, and I will say also the Secretary General, because of course the notifications under um, uh, ICCPR should go to the Secretary General. So we're very closely uh, monitoring this, uh, including of course, all of the varieties of those states that are not notifying, because I think as Yuval Shani was, was mentioning, there's of course the rather, rather complex analysis that has to be done on exactly what kind of, are there restrictions that are actually possible already um, under, under the possibilities uh, under, uh, apart from uh, emergency, and then what is the content of the actual state of emergency that has been declared. So we're definitely monitoring. As I said, we're coming out with the guidance that also draws on the general comment 29 that Yuval Shani was mentioning, uh, but other concerns are expressed there and that will serve as a guidance to states uh, for, for both for notifying, but actually also what is and what isn't acceptable for states of emergency. Um, this is, I think it's part of the, it's important to say it's part of our general work on monitoring on, on the impact of COVID. We're doing this globally. We're using the field presences to do this. So we're keeping a very close eye. We're gathering the evidence. We're coming out with the guidance on human rights that we have collaborated with other agencies of the UN that the Secretary General will be presenting. It's a brief that he will be doing, showing his engagement. But, but there it's very important to say that it's, it, it may sound general, but it actually already builds on factual evidence. We're not naming states, but we're doing a synthesis of the developments among states. So most definitely it's a big concern to us. The privacy issue is, is a key issue. It's one of those that all of us, I'm sure, are, are, are concerned about. Um, it's in this regard, I will, I'm sure others are better placed to answer so that I will only say that we also are here looking for good practice examples, because of course we do have those examples where there is this kind of the voluntary participation in, in the kind of notification using uh, new technology, for instance, is one of those examples that obviously would serve to allay the fears that were expressed in the question. So thanks for now. Thank you very much for that. And thank you to Lazary as well, who offered that question. Uh, the second question then, which is from Lyell, thank you Lyell, uh, is to Ambassador Ben da da uh, David. Um, and the question is, how will the pandemic, how do you think the pandemic, and especially the socio-economic consequences of this pandemic, will reshape uh, global governance, but also national government governance? So this goes to something that uh, the previous speaker, Ilsa, mentioned during her intervention. Uh, please, Ambassador, you have the floor. Do you hear me now? 
Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, yes, as I said uh, in the beginning, I think that the the uh, uh, the pandemic will have enormous consequences and will for many, uh, for everyone, and it will uh, strike in a in a asymmetrical uh, fashion. Uh, one one could say um, it will it will hit those who are marginalized and vulnerable already now, either by discrimination, being a national minority or an ethnic minority, or it will have uh, religious divides, or it will have a socio-economic uh, dimension or dimensions. Uh, so, so for us, it will be extremely important to be vigilant about uh, these matters. Sweden is a is uh, one of the leading uh, donors of international development cooperation and we are now um, making an inventory in our international engagement in this regard to see how we can make sure that uh, preventive measures and fighting the pandemic will reach everyone uh, irrespective of where you live in a humanitarian uh, situation, uh, whether you live in, in poverty, in conflict, or whether you are a woman or a man. Uh, this will be one of the huge challenges that we are, we are facing right now. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I will now um, pose the question to, the, to Annika Silva Leander. Uh, you spoke about the uh, changes or the difficulties in holding uh, democratic elections. Um, so the question I have from the audience, from the general public, is does the current situation force, and this is a very tricky question, so prepare yourself, uh, does the current situation force us to rethink our understanding of what democracy is, uh, both in terms of elections, but also uh, the removal of parliaments or the suspension of parliaments, for example, in terms of that removal of that check and balance on the executive. Uh, do we need to rethink uh, what we mean by democracy and good governance? Uh, yeah, indeed, challenging uh, question. Um, I, I would say that um, it doesn't force us to rethink the fundamental principles of democracy. Um, for, you know, um, popular control over public decision making and political equality in the exercise of that control. I think those principles are are fundamental and the basis for healthy democracies, and they remain uh, even in this pandemic situation. But what it what the situation forces us to do is to think about and to rethink how democracy is exercised. Um, and I think uh, it's a good, in a way, it's a, it's a blessing in disguise in the sense that um, we were already perceiving um, many limitations to the way democracy was functioning uh, before this pandemic hit. And as several of the speakers have said, this situation is forcing innovation and change in practices um, in a much quicker way than maybe uh, would have happened otherwise. Um, but the idea is that these innovations and these um, change in practices do not alter the fundamental principles of democracy. They remain in place. Uh, and that's really the challenge that we're facing uh, to strengthen democracy uh, and to strengthen the way democracy works, but not undermine its basic principles. Thank you very much. Um, another question from Lael, who's been very active, it seems, on the message board. Uh, this one to uh, Professor Shani. Um, I'm going to paraphrase it because it was a very long question, but I think one part of the question was, is there a concern that st if certain leaders and certain governments are taking advantage of the current situation uh, to circumvent rule, rule of law and democratic checks and balances? that they will continue to do so, so that the current controls or limitations placed on democracy and rule of law, that government, certain governments around the world will take a, a negative lesson from this and continue with these checks and limitations uh, into the future. 
Yeah, definitely. Of course. I mean, one of the one of the features that we are seeing of the current situation is that the use of uh, when we're talking about the use of emergency powers, this almost always translates itself to use of more power by the executive. So the executive is operating under fewer checks and balances. So uh, you have and, and for uh, for governments. This is actually a very sweet position to be in because you don't have to uh, mess around with courts. You don't have to mess around with parliaments. You can simply uh, issue uh, an ordinance, issue a proclamation, and then your will becomes, uh, becomes the law of the land. Uh, so in terms of uh, um, the logic of, uh, of the emergency situation does create a very, uh, you, could speak, you could say, tempting situation for um, for governments with authoritarian tendencies. And also, uh, I, mean, I mean, when we are seeing the poll numbers, I mean, for popularity indexes, we do see that in many countries, I mean, this is a situation where um, the leadership actually positions itself in a very um, uh, prominent uh, situation. They are in a way, uh, the life uh, of the population depends on them. And I think this is also a very, um, attractive position, at least on the short run, for, for, uh, for uh, governments to, to be positioned at. So, so there is definitely uh, this risk and it has to be, of course, uh, this is why both internal and also external safeguards uh, and supervision is, is, cr is, is crucial. So, so that these situations remain as, as temporary and exceptional as possible. If I can briefly also re re relate to the technology, to the technology issue, I, I think that was a very good question uh, raised by Jesse about the issue of uh, of the use of surveillance uh, technology. A and I think I, I think that here there is a. This is actually one of the areas where one has to engage in very difficult acts of balancing because. There is indeed a need, at least with respect to uh, retrospective epidemiological investigations, to, to trace the, the root of infections. Uh, but I think there is a very big difference, and Ilza mentioned this, between voluntary uh, participation in such programs, and I'm putting aside what is exactly voluntary, this is, could be a tricky issue, and non-voluntary, there is also a big difference between uh, privacy by design systems and design and systems that do not protect adequately privacy. And there is also a big difference between retrospective tracing and prospective social control. So, so the devil in these things is very much in the details of how exactly they are applied for which precise purpose and under which safeguards. Thank you very much. And last but not least, I'll turn to uh, Dr. Walecki. Uh, and the question is equally challenging as the one I posed uh, earlier. Um, when we look at the difficulties that the current pandemic has, play, has placed upon Western democracies, uh, especially heavily or strongly liberal Western democracies, um, will, do you think, the current crisis cause some of those democracies to reassess the functioning of their democracies uh, in terms of, making it better in the future to be able to address uh, these challenges and do so in a transparent and accountable way? Uh, or do you think that it will be a case of continuing as before? Difficult question to answer in a few seconds. I will just build on, on a previous answer. Um, what we are seeing is that the responses are very heterogeneous. We are seeing some regimes indeed where executive is, uh, you know, taking advantage of the situation and why it is important to monitor those regimes. Because I think if uh, all the predictions are going to be correct about upcoming major economic crisis, we're going to see um, how this economic crisis will further impact on a political crisis. And we are going to see, like history showed, some of those regimes, even you know, European EU member states, um, taking advantage of economic crisis to question issues such as public funding for opposition parties, resources for parliamentary opposition, uh, resources for NGOs, arguing that there are the other priorities. So I would be very concerned that uh, you know, those uh, mighty executive um, um, regimes um, will actually further use upcoming two, three years of economic hardship to further undermine democratic um, opposition, uh, liberal democracy. And uh, they will use, as we've seen it in a number of EU countries, will use this populistic narrative uh, 
that human rights are for a privileged few, for a rich few, um, and we have other issues to worry about. Uh, so, I mean, the next two or three years are going to be, in my opinion, a continuation of the struggle, which we've seen over the last few years. And, um, you know, I am afraid that the next few months will actually see some of those, I would even call them semi-authoritarian regimes consolidating themselves. They already crossed the Rubicon. They know that they went too far and they know that, uh, you know, if they actually revert, uh, they are going to be held accountable for the steps they've been taking over the last few months, uh, if not years. So, so you know, I, I am afraid uh, we will have to have more of those discussions. Uh, but, you know, um, I, I think, uh, as I said earlier, uh, the, region, the region is very heterogeneous. Uh, we also need good examples, uh, examples of how parliaments are responding uh, to this crisis, how they are, um, you know, helping with passing a good legislation, helping to address upcoming economic crisis. And just to, to finish on the point, uh, Professor Shani made, I mean, indeed, there is going to be appetite for strong leadership. But let's not forget that the element of the strong leadership is also accountability. And this is why we need to have a strong uh, parliaments and uh, rule of law, independent courts, because, uh, you know, too much power being given to unaccountable executive will end up, uh, as it did in 20th century, in many regimes, um, abusing uh, all the rights we've been fighting for for the last 30, for three decades, 30 years. Thank you very much. Very powerful final point. Thank you to all the speakers. Uh, you said a huge amount in a very short amount of time. I appreciate that. Thank you to Jessien um, for her uh, questions from a youth perspective and to all the other questions and comments that have been on the message board. It's been going crazy. I see 121 messages at least. Uh, before uh, we go. We're going to reward those of you who stay to the end by offering a last poll. At least my colleagues from Diplo are going to offer a last poll. Yeah, so the question is, are democracies or authorita authoritarian regimes better placed, seemingly, to control the spread of COVID-19? This is a, a provocative devil's advocate type question, but it'll be interesting to see your perceptions. Okay. Okay. Well, I mean, that really is interesting. 50-50, exactly uh, even split. Uh, thank you for all those votes. I guess that goes back to something Annika Ben-David said right at the beginning about the importance of uh, the narrative on this and showing that democracies uh, are very well placed to deal with these kinds of emergencies. Uh, Sadly, we don't have any time to discuss that because it's a very interesting finding because we're five minutes over. So I'm going to close the meeting, thanking again all of the speakers, thanking Felix, my co-moderator, uh, for the discussion, thanking everybody who participated, thanking the very clever people at Diplo, um, including Natasha and her team, without whom this kind of meeting would not be possible because I am terrible with technology. So thank you all. If I could just tell everybody that next week we will be back, same time, same place, i.e. on the internet, uh, to talk about the gender dimensions of the current COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and that will include uh, the participation of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet. So please, everybody, join us then. And in the meantime, have a very nice morning, afternoon, or evening, or night, wherever you are in the world. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.